Welcome to the podcast for Westside A Jesus Church. We hope this teaching encourages and empowers you to love, learn, and live the way of Jesus. But I'm very excited to be here because the last time I was here, <clears throat> which must have been four years ago, I can't believe it. You know, when you get old, time goes faster. You kids don't get old. That's why, really, I mean, stay young all your life. Uh, I know you can't help it, but try. And, uh, but the last time we used to invite people to come to Christ and go over to that room to pray. Now you switch back to the old thing of, like in the Bible, Phil reminded me, it's in the book. Uh, you, you receive Christ and you get baptized on the spot. So tonight we're hoping that many of you who have been thinking about it, maybe some of your grandmas, they'll get you out of the water. You know, they'll push you down and up, so don't worry. They won't let you. They'll even cover your nose if you have to. Uh, but it's an exciting moment. I remember I was 17 and a half, almost 18, when I was baptized as a kid in Argentina, South America. And uh, it was unforgettable, you know, to realize, man, I've made a commitment. I'm going to live for God and for Jesus Christ. It's pretty exciting. But okay, uh, what's the time? Oh, 2.15 already? Am I finished? No. Uh, I, uh, they, they have a, a clock, and I never know what the clock means. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I, uh, I, I said, don't get old. I have, and I can't help it. But last December, uh, November, we'd been in the south, some old Panama City, which is almost got blown away this week, and we were there for a conference. Then we went to England, and I had a cold that I couldn't get rid of. And when I got back after this, about four weeks on the road, I said to my wife, hey, babe, I better go to see the doctor. This thing isn't going away. I go, the guy checks me out, you know, and then he says, hey, let's have an x-ray. He didn't, couldn't think what else to do, and so he did an x-ray. And then his face got long when he showed it to me. He says, oh, boy, I think there's something wrong here, Luis. I'm sorry to tell you, but I think uh, something's really wrong. We better go to an oncologist. Said, oh, here we go. I've been 80, I was 83 years old then. I'm 84 this November. And I'd never been in a hospital one single night. Well, one night, but because I broke a bone like an idiot. It had nothing to do with, <laughs> nothing to do with being sick or anything. So I've never been in a hardly ever take aspirins. My wife takes them like candy. I don't. I hate them. You know, I, I wanted to save them for the day when I had the big one. And uh, so uh, we go to the, de the doctor. I don't like him anymore. But the, the, the other guys, I, I, we went over and he sits down and he said, okay, I've studied your x-ray. You are fourth what? I don't know. Fourth, fourth degree or something or other. Cancer. It's incurable. There is no known cure. And... Um, I said, what about surgery? No, surgery won't work. So I was getting the point. And I said, so how long have I got to live? He said, well, if you do chemotherapy, we'll try and prolong your quality of life for nine, maybe 12 months. And then, you know, I mean, he was very blunt. I like that, at least. <laughs> and I said, and if I don't do chemotherapy, I heard it's ugly. He said, well, four months and you're gone. Okay, I'll do chemo. And uh, so it's awful. I don't recommend it, but it's the only thing they have. Anyway, I thought, oh, wow. I've been preaching about heaven, you know, the assurance of eternal life and dying, and you've got to be with the Lord because my dad uh, died when I was 10 years old. And so to me, and he died a believer, uh, singing, clapping his hands, quoting the Bible and saying, I'm going to be with Jesus, you know. So to me, I've always talked about it. But uh, now I realize, oh, wow, let's check it all out again, you know. And some people say, well, the Bible doesn't say that much about heaven. Uh, now I answer, what Bible are you reading, buddy, you know. I mean, there's stuff all over the Bible about heaven. And, you know, when you know that you're going to heaven, there's a tremendous peace. You know, the other day my, my doctor, what do they call the fellow that's your permanent guy? Anyway, whatever they call him, he's our doctor. We pay him. And uh, he's, a, he's a good buddy. He's not a believer yet. He, when he was studying at U of O Medicine, he said he would go to First Baptist Church, but not to hear the gospel, but because the girls were pretty and they had a basketball court. That's why he went to First Baptist. So he knows a little bit about it, and he's a really nice guy. We become friends. We have dinner together. I hope he's a good doctor, too. But, uh, you know, people nowadays say, you know, uh, well, uh, they're talking about heaven. You know, we want to talk about today here, here on earth. And, and the thought is, yeah, absolutely, so do I. But have you heard of C.S. Lewis? He was a professor at Oxford and Cambridge, and he became 
a Christian from being an atheist. And he made this statement that I've always liked for those of you, all three of you who are intellectuals here tonight. Uh, <laughs> it goes like this. He said, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think about the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. It's a very strong statement from a very intelligent person. And you know, I have become very unashamed of talking about heaven. I never was ashamed because uh, I'll tell you why in a few minutes. But people have funny ideas about heaven. So I thought tonight, I hope you young guys don't fall asleep uh, on me, you know. I think you'll be interested. <clears throat> I have a friend who used to be the uh, uh, chaplain for the trailblazers. And he had a beautiful 16-year-old daughter about 30 years ago. And uh, she was just a nice church kid. But in high school, she made a few friends that were a little iffy. And one night, they were coming down Cedar Hills Boulevard in Be Beaverton. And the kid who was driving had been drinking, lost control of the car, and she was killed. She was only 16. I mean, you don't think of kids getting dying, but they do. And she was a believer, stupid to mingle with the wrong idiots, but nevertheless, she was a believer, and so she went to be with the Lord. But the point I'm telling you is because kids die, women die, boys die, teenagers die, grandpas and grandmas, for sure. And all of you gray-headed people, <laughs> I hope you're ready because it comes sooner than you think. Uh, yeah. uh, people have funny ideas about heaven. I'm, I'm going to read the Bible in a second, but I thought I'd pull a few of the others. Uh, you know, one day, the, our pastor's wife, uh, mother-in-law, died. And once somebody in the church said, Nana is an angel now. No, she's not an angel. Nana is Nana, okay? <laughs> angels are angels. But one day I picked up from California, it would be California, uh, a, a bunch of six and eight and nine-year-old kids their thoughts about heaven. It was a secular thing, one of those Sunday magazines, you know. And I, I got a few for you. This one says, when you die, this is a kid called Steve, eight years old. When you die, God takes care of you, like your mother did when you were alive. Only God doesn't yell at you all the time. <laughs> it's profound thinking by an eight-year-old. I got a pile, but I'll only read about six of them. Jimmy, he's eight years old too. When you die, they bury you in the ground, and your soul goes to heaven. But your body can't go to heaven because it's too crowded up there already. <laughs> so you can tell he's thinking, you know. Let's see, do we have any girls here? Oh, yeah. Uh, this guy, this girl, Judy, she's nine. Only the good people go to heaven. The other people go where it's hot all the time, like in Florida. <laughs> uh, I like that one. There. Yeah. This is another one from another thinking girl, Marsha, nine. When you die, you don't have to do homework in heaven, unless your teacher is there too. <laughs> but the best is this one. This one really makes me proud as a Latin macho. This guy says, I'm not afraid to die because I'm a Boy Scout. Ah, man. There's a real man for you, huh? Or a girl too, because now the girls go to Boy Scouts. Anyway, let's not get into that, okay? Yeah. But you know the subject of heaven you have to settle it the younger the better. I realized I wanted to settle it because, as I told you, my dad died and I was only seven years old, 10 years old. So long ago, I can't remember. But uh, it, it was real, you know. He died and there he was. His body didn't move. They sang some hymns. They read a passage from the Bible. And then they put him in Argentina, put him in a, uh, some kind of a hearse or something and went to the hospital. Uh, my family didn't want me to go, so I wouldn't be traumatized. I wanted to be traumatized. I said to myself, I'm going to throw the first piece of dirt on my dad's casket. And I jumped on a truck that one of the workers that my dad had was driving, and I said, take me, uh, take, take me to the cemetery. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. So I dum dum dumped at the bottom of the truck, and I went over there. And when we went to the cemetery, I walked under the legs of some of the old timers, and as soon as they put my dad's casket, I threw a piece of whatever, you know, dirt or something. I felt like a real man. I beat the system. But I, it made me realize death is real. And when you're gone, you don't come back to the planet Earth. You're gone, you're off into eternity. And you know, we need to therefore prepare. C.S. Lewis one day said something like this also. He said, this is the biggest decision that you'll ever make because it determines your destiny forever and ever and ever. All other decisions are puny and very brief 
in comparison to this one? Are you ready for your trip to heaven? That's the question I have. And the invitation at the end will be, if you are not sure, why not make sure? Now, there's another airport. It starts with an H also. It's hell, and it's not a recommended airport to drive, land in, okay? Well, I recommend tonight that you choose heaven. They both start with an H. Don't go to hell. It's not a place you want to go. Whatever it is, it doesn't sound like a good thing when you read about it. So I hope tonight all of you who are not sure will say, tonight's the night, man. I'm going to seal this thing, and I'm going to have the assurance of eternal life. Now, just another thing, and then I want to read to you. Don't, don't fall asleep on me. Two passages about heaven that are really beautifully clear and that will excite you, actually. Uh, the, the first thing is, God has revealed a lot about heaven, and He does it in terms that we can understand. Intellectuals can understand it if they want to, and very humble people can understand it, and God has written it in such a way that we know what He's talking about if you really want to know. And uh, the first one is, uh, I'm going to read to you as the story in the Bible, of book of Acts, uh, very brief, of the first fellow who was killed, according to the Bible, for the sake of Jesus Christ. His name was Stephen, and he was stoned to death by the people who were very angry because he was very devoted to Jesus Christ. So let me read it to you. It's just one, two paragraphs. Here's, here's what it says. Stephen had been talking for about 45 minutes, we estimate, and telling them about the history of the nation and so on. And then when he comes to the end of his talk, he, he really says, when they heard this, what Stephen was saying about Jesus, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, listen to this, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, the crowd covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, here comes, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees, and he cried out, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, here's the first story that we read about after Jesus had gone back to heaven of a man dying, and he sees heaven open, and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father, and he says to him, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He lay down, and he fell asleep. And you know, that is a beautiful picture to begin with. The second one, if you don't mind, and even if you do, uh, uh, let, let me read you another few verses, okay? This one is a description partly about heaven. There's many passages you could spend all night, and I recommend you do it. But here we go. This one is in 2 Corinthians 5. Listen to what it says. The Apostle Paul is talking about dying and what happens to your body and what happens when you die and you go to heaven and so on. Now we know that if this earthly tent, that's what he calls the body, the earthly tent that we live in is, um, we, uh, we, if we leave it, that is, uh, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, while we're still on earth, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we're in this tent, uh, we are grown and we are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, it is God who has made us for this very purpose and He's given us the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we're always confident and we know that as long as we're in the body, we're away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. And here it comes. We are confident, they say, and we would prefer to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due to Him for what He's done while in the body. 
Okay, it's a bit complicated, but I thought I should read it so you can get it for your background, okay? Now, as I began to think about my own dying, and you know, it, the, originally the guy told me last December, the guy's the doctor, uh, by next Christmas you won't be around. Yeah, it's an interesting thought, you know? So this week I went to see my oncologist again, and in a month they're going to do another CAT scan where they really check on your tumor, which is a cancerous, you know, and I said to him, am I, am I going <laughs> to, I said to him on Wednesday, are we going to, am I going to be alive for this Christmas? Oh, yes, he said. Well, you're going to outlive us all. Eh, thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I hope she's right. At least I'll have a good Christmas. It looks like I'm going to be around. But the, the thought is, I began to study more about heaven. Uh, some of the basics, I've had it in my head since I was a boy. Uh, well, at age 12, I made the decision that many of you are going to make tonight. I decided to receive Christ, and then a few weeks, years later, as I told you, I was baptized. I should have done it that same night and not waited all this time. But I have found so many things about heaven that I just had to tell you tonight, and then I hope I can tantalize you because that's what God wants to do for all of you to come to know Jesus Christ because the assurance of heaven is a gift of God. It isn't for good people. None of us is good. If it was for good people, heaven would be empty except for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There'd be nobody else in there. We'd all be in the other airport that I told you about that you should avoid as much as you can. You know, we'd all be in hell, to put it plainly. Okay, so then I made a list that I hope you enjoy it tonight, and then that God speaks to your heart, as one of the songs said at the beginning. First, this I found out now. I hadn't thought about it in the past. But believe me, I read the last book of the New Testament quite a lot lately. It's called Revelation. Enjoy it. It mentions heaven about 17 times. I kind of like that. Uh, and then the, there's another book of the book of Hebrews. It also talks about heaven about 20 times. So it isn't just a little spot here, a bit spot there. It's, it's very good. The first thing is this, that I discovered in the last few weeks, even though I've read it for 50 years, for goodness sakes. Uh, heaven is the place where the throne of God Almighty is established. It is a place. The Bible calls it heaven. And it's where the throne of God is established. In other words, God Almighty, as the King of kings and Lord of lords, as He's called in the book of Revelation, has a throne. And the throne is mentioned in the book of Revelation about 14 times, if I'm not mistaken. 14 times. So <clears throat> the first thing it says is, I saw a door open in heaven and the throne and God seated on the throne. Man, so the first thing we're going to see when we get to heaven is going to be the door is open, the throne of God is there, God the Father apparently sits on the main chair, God the Son on the right, and God the Holy Spirit all over the place. So you're going to be going to heaven and you suddenly read, before me he says, I saw a, 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 door, a, a throne in heaven. I wrote down. In another place it says, uh, I saw a great white throne. That's at the end of Revelation. So the throne speaks about God being the king, sovereign, in charge of the universe. And at the end it talks about the great white throne. The great white throne is where people go to be shown why they are being condemned. But it's too late already. So that's why tonight... Where are we? In Portland, Oregon somewhere, more or less. Uh, <clears throat> the Lord is saying to you, get ready. Forget the great white throne. You don't have to go there. If you open your heart to my son, Jesus Christ, you will go straight to eternal life in heaven forever and ever. And that's an exciting concept. Then in another place it says, God says, heaven is my throne, he says, and uh, the earth is my footstool. So God sees heaven himself. Heaven is my throne. That's an amazing thing. And don't forget that. Write it down in your Bible as you start reading about it some more. To me, it's given me a lot of peace the last few weeks, you know. When you think, when you begin to, the, the doctor says, is your back hurting? No. Is your front hurting? No. She's expecting something to happen. And, and then I, I'm not too worried about it. I mean, I, I don't look forward to dying. The Bible calls death the last enemy. So it's an enemy. It's not like, ooh, what fun, I'm going to die. You know, I mean, no, it's an enemy, but it's an enemy that's been conquered when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Okay, we'll get back to that. The second thing I read is this. Listen to this. Heaven is filled with multitudes of thousands upon thousands and even millions of people. 
It talks about 10,000 times 10,000. I'm not a mathematician that well. Some, somebody from U of O or something tell us what 10,000 times 10,000. And thousands upon thousands. Millions of people. Heaven is going to be jammed with people. A lot of people are not going to go there by choice. But it's going to be. And, and the Bible puts it so beautifully. The Lord says, God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. St. Peter says, God wants all people to be saved and to come to repentance. The Lord Jesus himself, talking about boys and girls, said, God is not willing that one of these little ones should perish. Not one. He wants everybody to have eternal life. It's people who refuse it that then end up lost forever. But God is begging you. He says, come, be reconciled to me. Come, get to know God. Be reconciled to God. God wants... And then the other day I was reading one of the stories that the Lord Jesus told that we call a parable. And he says, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not dying. I'm just, <laughs> I'll wait to be out of here. Uh, uh, Jesus says, go out into all the highways and the places you can find. I'm filled this, I want my house to be filled. It was a parable about the wedding of one of his sons. But God wants his house to be full. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. I don't care who the worst person in the world. God wants all people to be saved. And it says in another place, my house, I want it full. So the Lord wants you, no matter what you've done. And we've all got a story. Listen, if you've been watching that thing about Kavanaugh, have you been watching? I bet you young guys don't even look at your iPhone. But some of us old timers still read the paper. And you know, and they've got this guy, and he did apparently something naughty when he was in high school. Who in high school, my wife has asked, you talk to her later, but, you know, who don't, who, which of us doesn't have some story from high school that we, uh, you know, we did stuff we'd rather nobody find out, much less in Washington where they publicize it worldwide, you know. I mean, I haven't because I was a saint from the get-go, but, you know, uh, my, I, I, my wife is the one who said, who doesn't have a story of high school? I mean, let's face it, only a few super saints, and there's about 22 in the whole world, you know, but... The, the fact is that God wants us all in heaven. Not because we deserve it, but because He loves us. And He loves us because He wants us. And He wants us to be in fellowship with Him, to be friends of God. That's what happens when you become a follower of Jesus. You become a friend of God. And life becomes... You know, now I'm, that I'm 83 going on 84, I can tell you, I've loved the Lord Jesus since I was 12 years old, for sure, when I gave my heart to Christ. And it's been a glorious life. Ups and downs, sure. All sorts of stuff. Financial, physical... Uh, economic revolutions in Latin America. You know, I mean, I'm from down there. There's revolutions all the time. You never know what tank is going to bomb your house, you know. I mean, that's the way it is. But the fact is, it's been a glorious life. And for you who are young in particular, I beg you, come to Christ now before you get old and you mess up your life and Satan makes fun of you and trips you up and you mess up royally and you end up in Washington, D.C. in trouble, you know. I mean, honestly. <laughs> If you want to get into trouble, go to Washington, D.C. There's an old saying, you know, if you want a friend in Washington, buy a dog. I mean, that, that's a profound statement. But uh, the fact is, the third thing the Bible teaches is this. Heaven is the Father's house. That's a beautiful picture. My wife has used to teach a lot to women when she was younger. And uh, she talked about, you know, Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. It's the Father's house. And then he says, uh, uh, no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way and the truth and the life. If you want to know God as your Father, woman, if you want to know God as your Father, young man, come to Christ and say, God, you're my Creator, but I want to know you as my Father, my spiritual Father. And you know, when you come to Christ, you have a home in heaven. It's already there. It's been prepared by Jesus Christ. That's the way he put it. And, you know, we've got to learn to think about God's revelation the way he chose to reveal himself. I am going to prepare a place for you. In, in, in the old King James translation, it used to say, In my father's house there are many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I like that. Now, these modern translations say, uh, There are many rooms. Yeah, it sounds like a Motel 6, you know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't give me a mansion, not a Motel 6. I mean, I can get one for 50 bucks uh, right down the freeway here. You know, no, I, I'm going to prepare for you a mansion. 
That's what. It's a beautiful place. Even like you had a good place in the Caribbean, like you see on the ads, you know, like green transparent water and all these dancing beauties and all this and that. You know, <laughs> heaven is going to be better than that, imagine. It's going to be perfect. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. But you know, he prepared a place. The fourth thing that I've learned about heaven, studying the book of Revelation, is that the theme of heaven, they sing a lot, they worship a lot, they seem to be having the greatest fun, and obviously it's going to be fabulous. But the theme of heaven is the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ. I read the other day that there's about 14 hymns or songs in the book of Revelation talking about heaven. 14 of them. And the theme of each one of them is Jesus Christ who died for us on the cross. Jesus Christ who gave his blood to pay for our forgiveness. Jesus Christ who suffered in our place what we should have suffered in hell. He suffered on the cross. And the theme of the worship is all centered on Jesus Christ. It's going to be so fabulous we can't even imagine, you know. I watch these musicians singing, I suppose it's called. And, uh, you know, and they, they have fun and they smile and they shake and all the rest of it, you know. And, and I think I wish I could do that. I would really wreck the service if I did, you know. But the fact is that in heaven, it's going to be an endless party. You know, Jesus says, you remember, I stand at your door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. In other words, he's saying, we'll have a party that will never end. And that's what heaven's going to be. It's going to be so glorious. The other day I read a thing I really liked that I'd never thought about it by a fellow called Spurgeon, an old English preacher from the 1800s. I almost met him. And uh, he, uh, he, said, he said these words. He said, when we get to heaven, we will never sin again. And I thought, shoot, I never thought of that. Well, how exciting. We will never sin again. Man, it's not going to be boring. It's going to be great. We're not going to be running from anyone. We're not going to be hiding. We won't worry about the Washington Post or Fox Television or anybody, you know. I mean, it, we will have our sins forgiven. Nobody will bring it up again except when we worship Jesus Christ. It says, you rescued us from our sins. You rescued us on the cross. We love you, Lord Jesus. Oh, man, it's going to be so thrilling and exciting. But the theme of heaven is that. And if tonight you say, Luis... If you knew my story, you wouldn't say it's that easy. Nobody said it's easy. It's free. That's what it is. It's a gift of God. And God says, I forgive you because my son paid in your place. My son paid with his blood. I forgive you. I forgive you. Just let me come into your life. And so that's what the Lord is saying to you tonight. No matter what you've done, it may be a terrible thing. In our church lately, we've had quite a few ex-convicts joining our church. They've been converted. And uh, they've been baptized, and they're in. We still watch our verses, but that's another thing, you know. Uh, they, but the, the fact is that many of these guys were naughty boys, huh? And some naughty girls too, believe me. They are the most frightening. But uh, the, the fact is that we got some fellows over there that you get a, you know, wow. Are they in? Yes, they're in. Because they repented sincerely. They did pretty bad stuff, some of them, really. But now it's good to see the change. They're loud sometimes, louder than you. And, you know, they, they talk to the Lord out loud sometimes, and they try to sing, and they're awful at it. And, you know, but they're all there. It's a big church. It's a mother church to this church, you know. So you better learn something from us. But the truth is this. In heaven, there's something else. Heaven, Jesus Christ is glorified as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And, you know, one of the greatest things, I think, in the Bible, it says, His servants shall serve him, and listen to this, they shall see his face. They shall see his face. Think of it. I mean, you've seen pictures of Jesus in Catholic churches or museums. If you've been to Europe, there's a 10 million of them. And uh, when we, the, the Jesus people revolution way back in the 70s, some beautiful pictures that I thought of, maybe Jesus looks a little like this one. I like that picture, you know. Some of the pictures in some of the old churches, he looks like, ah, like this, you know, like he's just being choked to death. And uh, you say, no, 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 Jesus must have a beautiful face. And the Bible says, we shall see his face. 
The, your eyes, the Bible says, shall see the king in his beauty. Man, I can't wait to serve Jesus Christ and see him. We shall see him as he is. Up to now, none of us have seen him face to face. But when we get there, you will see him and I will see him. And we'll fall at his feet, you know. What a day that's going to be. And that's what heaven is, is also about. And God's plan is a staggering plan. It's so beautiful. It's such a giveaway that the Lord says, come. All is ready. Come. I'm ready for you. And tonight the Lord says that to you right here at this Jesus Church on the west side of Portland. Yeah, you know, somebody might say, what about the little children? You know, uh, Coach Dungy, you remember him? He was a great uh, Super Bowl champion coach, the first African-American uh, whose team won the, the, the Super Bowl. And his 19-year-old boy died. And the mother was totally, completely broken up. He was too. And my wife and I were at a festival, Phil, I think, was there too, in Florida. I think it was, uh, doesn't matter, one of the Florida cities. Uh, Orlando. And he heard me talk about heaven. And he said, boy, could you come and talk to my wife? She is so broken up about our boy dying that she just can't find consolation. She can't be happy. She's just so sad. So he said, yeah, we're going to be some other town in Florida in a few months. So he was the chairman or the honorary chairman. So he brought her. Pat and I sat in our RV quietly on the side. And we began to tell us something that I heard from an old, old preacher who's dead but still is on the radio. I don't know how he does it, but he is still on. <laughs> and uh, he said these words, A brief life is not an incomplete life. A brief life is not an incomplete life in God's sight. So your boy died at 19. He was a believer. Ah, he is with the Lord. A baby who dies, Jesus said, let the little babies or let the little children come to me. For to such is the kingdom of heaven. On the cross of Christ, Jesus Christ died for all the innocents. What about those who are mentally not quite up to par? Okay, he died for them too. And the, and the mercy and the grace of God. A brief life, remember that, is not an incomplete life in the Lord's sight. That baby is with the Lord. That child is with the Lord. That son of yours, that daughter of yours, they're with the Lord. And one day we'll join them and all things will be forgotten. It will be worth it all. And all him used to say, when we see Jesus... Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. And you know, we're going to leave the suffering uh, behind. Okay, I'm jumping the gun here. Number five or whatever. Uh, heaven is a place of extreme joy and happiness for all the people of God, all the children of God. Now you may say, well, aren't we all children of God? No, the Bible distinguishes. We're all created by God, but only those who believe in Jesus Christ with a sincere repentance, become children of God. To all those who believe Him, the Bible says, who believe in His name, who receive Him, they shall become children of God. Are you a child of God tonight? Could you say, yes, I'm a nasty one and I'm a naughty one, but I am a child of God <laughs> because I have repented, I have received Jesus Christ, and I know He's my only Savior. Can you say that? If you can't, what are you waiting for? The Lord says, I want my house to be full and you're one of them. He wants you to be there. But it's going to be the eternal place for the people of God. Other people would be very uncomfortable. I mean, if you reject Christ, you don't even want to be with all these fools like you and I. You know, you don't want it. But if you love Christ, you are there and it's a beautiful place. Then heaven is also number seven, I think, a place of true holiness and moral purity. Nothing evil will enter there. You may say, well, I'm evil in thought, in word, in deed. I've done a lot of stuff I shouldn't do. I've said stuff I regret, and I think things that too. There was an Englishman I quoted many times, probably did it here years ago. He said, if I wrote down every thought I've ever thought and every deed I've ever done, people would call me a monster of depravity. When I read that, I thought, yeah, if I wrote down every thought I've ever thought and every deed I've ever done, it'd be a bestseller at San Francisco airport, you know? I mean, it's bad. 
Now, new grannies too. Don't look at me like I'm the worst. Uh, uh, everybody has their story. Everybody has their story. And if we wrote the truth, probably people wouldn't want you in here. They wouldn't shake your hand because we all have our story. But the beautiful thing is this. Once we have received Jesus Christ in the justice of God and in the sight of God, we are cleansed and purified as if we had never sinned. But we have. And because of the cross, we are forgiven. And you can go home dancing on one foot and singing all the way home, knowing my sins are forgiven, my, my guilt is gone, thanks to the cross of Jesus Christ. So if you've never made that decision, do it tonight in a few minutes and be baptized once and for all and live for Jesus Christ for the rest of your life. But there's number, yes, amen, give him a hand. Another thing about heaven that I want you to not forget. I know the Lord knows how to explain things better than anyone. An Oxford professor can understand it if they want to. Not all of them do, but if they do, they can. And a humble peasant on the mountains of South America who doesn't have even a second grade education can understand it too. When the Bible talks about heaven, it always talks about it as up there, up there. The Lord wants you to think heaven is up there, hell is the other airport is down there somewhere. Don't even try to figure it out. Because heaven is the place where God wants you to go. And it says, he looked up into heaven. When Jesus rose from the dead and he returned to heaven, he said, he ascended into heaven. And as they were looking up into the clouds, two angels came down and said, oh, Galileans, what are you looking up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come again the same way you saw him go up into heaven. He wants us to think of it as up there. So you don't have to. My grandpa, who thought he was very smart because he was from Scotland, uh, he used to say, ha, oh, oh, ha, oh. ha. In those days, they didn't know that the world is round. So when you're looking up here, the other guys are looking down there. Ha, ha, ha to yourself, grandpa. You know, I mean, uh, by now he knows I'm afraid he's in the wrong airport. And uh, there's no way out of that one. Uh, but, but he thought he was so smart, mocking believers. We don't have to be the most brilliant people to know what the Lord means. It's up there. And when you think of heaven, it's up there. He wants us to think of it. And then the other thing about heaven, I want you to know, it's a place of perfection. Let me give you four areas where we're perfect when we get to heaven. This one is a beautiful one. First John chapter 3 in the Bible. We shall be like him, Jesus, because we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him. Imagine you, me, ugly me, handsome you. We shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Moral perfection. That's what he's talking about. Moral perfection. Think of it. You and I will be so like Jesus that we shall be like him. And the old things are passed away. And all the naughty stuff that we thought about and talked about and done, gone forever. That's a beautiful thing. Perfection, moral perfection. We shall be like him. Think about that. Think about yourself for one minute. Me, the Lord, I shall be like him. And you'll be like him. Morally perfect. Number two, I wrote it down. We shall know as we are known. 1 Corinthians 13. It says that we will know just like God knows us. Every question you have, and we all have questions. I don't question God but I have questions to ask him someday. There's a difference between questioning God and having questions. All the answers may not come here. But when we get there, we shall know as we are known. We'll know all the questions. For instance, oh no, for instance, it takes too much time. But okay, for instance, one. Yeah, how God is one God in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet one God, just like you, created in the image of God. You are one person, and yet in three parts. Just like you are created in the image of God and His Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are one person, but in three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Your body is you, part of you. Your soul is you. Your spirit is you, and yet you are one. Hey, answer that one for me. Hey, when we get there, let's have a party. Let's have a, you know, what's it called here? Solid rock. And, uh, you know, let's get together and say, hey, I understand it now. Ask me any question you, you want. Number three, it says uh, there will be perfect peace in heaven. Because it says, he will wipe away every tear. There will be no more mourning, no more illness, no more death, 
No more crying, no more pain. Perfect peace. It's all over. We don't need OHSU. We don't need the doctor who's an elder here. We don't need the nurses. We don't need you, you all who take care of people with dementia and all that. I think a lot about that lately. Uh, you know, and you're doing a great job. But we won't need you anymore. We'll all be gloriously free at peace with God. Number four, the body will be imperishable. There's a thing called the resurrection. When Jesus comes back, all of us who are already dead, I plan to be there probably pretty soon, uh, my body will be buried up on the West Hills. I already paid for it, a lot of money. And uh, <laughs> so we got a place for my wife and I. Man, oh man, it costs a lot to die. But anyway, uh, it'll all be up there. Nobody will show up. Maybe once every decade, the boys will say, gee, we haven't taken any flowers for dad. Not that I'm looking, but you know. Uh, <laughs> but so my body will be up on the West Hills, but I'll be enjoying heaven. When Jesus comes back, the Bible says we'll all come with him and our bodies will be resurrected in the twinkling of an eye. Bang, just like that. And all of you who are still alive, you young ones, if you're still alive, your bodies will be changed instantly. And those of us who are still already in heaven, our bodies will be raised and they will be like the resurrection body of Jesus Christ. That's a whole subject. Ask Phil to talk to you about that, you know. <laughs> but it'll be a perfect body. So perfect morally, perfect in terms of body, uh, no more crying, no more pain, no more sadness, no more tears, no more hurts, nothing of that. And then the resurrection will be a glorious thing. And then I want to say this. When you die, the Bible teaches very clearly, and this is the most important thing I'll nail with you tonight and give you the invitation to come and be baptized and confess Jesus Christ. This is what the Bible teaches. When you die, a believer dies, body, soul, and spirit, okay? Supposing I die on January 1 next year, and the doctor says, oh, little Louis, sweet little Louis, he's gone. Okay, so I was, you know. And uh, but where is Louis? Okay. His body is at St. Vincent's Hospital or somewhere. And, uh, but where's Luis? His soul, his spirit. We just read it, if you notice. It says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. The moment your heart stops beating for good and the doctor says, he's gone. He passed, as they say nowadays. Uh, he passed. Where is he? My soul, my spirit, I Instead of living in this tent, this body, for the moment is buried on the west hills of Portland, but I'm in heaven with the Lord. And the beautiful thing is, your body is lying there, and they're going to bury it, and everybody will cry or pretend to. And, uh, you know, but where will you be? You'll be in the presence of the Lord once and for all. And it happens like that in one second. And the, if we had time, I'd go to John chapter something or other, where Lazarus was raised from the dead, chapter 11, and Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. And then listen to this. But whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Whew, that's one to meditate on, and I've done it lately. It's quite simple. It means this. You don't really die in the sense of disappearing for a while. You are dead in the sense that people look at your body and say, he's dead. But, in fact, I'm alive like never before in the presence of the Lord. So I didn't really die-die. In one instant, I left the body on planet Earth, and I took off for heaven. That is such a glorious truth. And my father, when he died, knew all this. He was only 34. He was a young dad, six kids, five and a half. The sixth one was almost there. And uh, so he dies, and he's in bed, and he's singing, and he claps his hands. And he began to sing about heaven. And then he pointed up to heaven and he said, I'm going to be with Jesus, which is better by far. And a few moments later, he'd gone to be with the Lord. And that's quotation from the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. What a glorious truth. So heaven is a beautiful place. It's God's house. It's prepared for us. It's a place of perfection. It's a place of in endless joy. And all of us who love Jesus Christ and trust Him, we will go there for sure, either when He comes back in the clouds, or if we go before He comes back, we go to be with the Lord. Is that exciting or what? Yes? Yeah. Uh, amen. I think we should give the Lord a hand. But I have a duty 
I want to ask you tonight, where will you be a thousand years from tonight? Will you be in heaven or will you be in the other airport? And there's no way out. Once you die, the story is over. You either go to be with Christ forever and ever and enjoy the beauties of His place or you're lost forever. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, I beg you tonight, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Open your heart to Him. Let Him come into your life. Surrender to Him and say, Lord Jesus, I never thought it would be this wonderful. I need you to forgive me. Please forgive me. Please give me eternal life. You died for me on the cross. I love you. I need you. I want you. I will serve you. Take me, Lord. Take me. And you know what he's doing? He's waiting right here. You can't see him, but he's here waiting for every one of you who have yet to make that decision to say, yes, once and for all, I'm ready to go. And I will open my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to finish. There was a little boy whose uh, dad was an atheist. I read this years ago. And he wouldn't go to church, talk about God, except for swearing. And this little boy, and he, he'd become a widower. His little boy was eight years old, and a neighbor, grandma, grandmas are good to do this kind of thing. A grandma said, let me take your boy to Sunday school. Let me take your boy to Sunday school. And the dad finally one day said, oh, take the boy to Sunday school. You know, he'd had it with the old lady. And uh, when he came back for lunch that Sunday, he said, Daddy, today I was invited to go to heaven. And I accepted the invitation. And you know, I beg you tonight, God is asking you to go to heaven. And it's a free gift of God. But you have to accept the invitation. If you don't accept it, you're condemning yourself. I would have said, don't be stupid, but my wife would rebuke me for that. So I won't say it. But don't be, you know. <laughs> be wise and say, Lord, why have I waited this long? But it's never too late. Never too late. But you can open your heart to Christ tonight. And I hope that many of you will do so. Because the Bible says to all those who receive Him, who believe in His name, He gives them the right to become children of God. Oh, it would be so good if when they, we give you the invitation in a minute, we'll have a prayer. And let's pray. Let's bow our heads before God, shall we? And for those of you, dear friends, who have yet made that, to make that commitment, would you join us in this prayer? And then we'll have you to come and be baptized to confess Jesus Christ. And they'll explain it, how they do it here at this church. But let's pray. And if you in your heart say, Oh God, I really want to know you. I need to have the assurance of eternal life. I want to know that heaven is my home. I thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ, O oh God. Thank you that he paid the price that I should have paid. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you chose to go to the cross. And tonight, Lord Jesus, I open my heart to you come into my life even now wash away all my guilt all the sad memories all the evil things I've thought the wrong things I've said and my behavior that has offended you. Oh Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life right now. Take over, oh Lord, and make me your child. And one day I'll see you face to face and worship you forever. What a day that's going to be. Thank you, Father. I know you've heard my prayer. Now I'm forgiven. Now I'm your child. Now heaven is my home. Thank you, God. In the name of Jesus Christ. 
Amen. Amen.